These men were unfaithful in sound speech. Their talk is just not worth a thing. It's fruitless and amounts to nothing as 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6 speaks about. Now it says that these people in Crete could talk glibly, but all their talk was ineffective in bringing anyone step nearer to goodness. Their talk produced no spiritual benefits and in fact robbed the hearers of the truth, which led them into error. The cynics used to say that all knowledge which is not profitable for virtue is vain. The teacher who simply provides his pupils with a forum for a pleasant intellectual and speculative discussion teaches in vain. Shakespeare would describe them as full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. See, these liars are the opposite of what verse 9 talks about. They hold not to sound doctrine. They're also unfaithful in right motives. Point blank, these men deceive. Phrenopates is the Greek transliteration that means a, a mind deceiver. That is to say, deceivers of men's minds. They make men believe what they are hearing is truth, only deceiving them. Second Peter 2 and 1 Timothy chapter 4 advise that those who listen to them want to hear their venom. And that goes back to Jeremiah 5 verse 31 which talks about they love to have it so. But to go on, Paul actually gives us a visual description of who exactly these men are of these people. And this visual example of a re rebellious leader in the world is the men of the circumcision. Now in Acts 2 verse 11, it indicates that Jews resided in Crete. These were the men that had challenged Paul in the cities he preached in when he warned of them in Philippians 3 verse 2. And he dealt with them in Galatians chapters 1 through 6 is what I'm going to say and Acts 13 verse 15. These men had the audacity to say stuff like this. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses you cannot be saved. That's from Acts 15 verse 1. See, something needs to be done here. Paul prepared Titus. He told Titus the problem, which one can only conclude that Titus was going to be a part of solving the false teacher issue. When you have a world of rebellious men, noting the problem is not enough. We must execute the will of God. In other words, silence the voice of these men and women. So what must be done to silence these rebellious men in verse 11? The false teacher must be silenced. So how do you silence the rebellious false teacher? Well, let's look at that in the silencing of the rebellious false teacher. B silences epi, epi, epistem, epistomizo. And it comes from epi upon and stoma, the mouth. And it really originally meant to put something upon the mouth as so as to stop it or reduce it to silence. It was used to describe placing a bit into the horse's mouth. The idea is to close the mouth by means of applying a muscle or a gag and is used figuratively to referring to preventing someone from talking. The voice of a false teacher has to be taken away. You silence this voice by speaking truth. Now let's go back to Jeremiah 23 for a second and look at verse 16. Listen. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. You tell men in the correct way to stop letting these men feed their minds. 
Although some devote countless hours to destroying false teachers, the simple thing to do is obey the Lord. When he leads you to shut their mouth, you shut it. Give biblical truth to those who are willing to hear it. Now you got to know this when you do that. Unfortunately, and, and don't let this stop you, men, not all men are going to listen to you. Some men are going to ignore you. But that can cause the question to come about. Well, if that's the case, why does the Lord want to shut their mouths? Well, we got to continue to look in the text. Why the false teacher must be silenced? Well, it's three things. Their unfaithful behavior upsets households. Their unfaithful behavior is in the doctrine they teach. And they're unfaithful because of the long for worldly gain or riches. So their unfaithful behavior upsets old households. You can look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. They tear up households. They destroy them. This is different from the biblical pastor that is described earlier in Titus who is to uphold godly living within the house. Number two, they always, they're unfaithful in doctrine. They teach things not lined up with the Holy Scriptures. They only give few Bible verses. And they twist them at that. They don't exposit the text. They don't give you the Bible. They don't give you God's voice. They give you their voice, their ideas, their opinions. They're unfaithful because they long for worldly gain and riches. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 5 we see this. They chase money and they want men that the men that they deceive to chase it too. See, Jesus Christ was clear on this in Matthew 6 and verse 24 when he talked about I mean, you cannot have two masters. You will either hate the one or love the other. Or you cannot serve God and money or mammon. Men, we've got to silence this with truth because that is the message the world desires to receive. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 through 4. We have got to shut it down and we do it biblically. We as men allow God to call us to the pastorate or to whatever calling he calls us to in leadership and you speak the truth. You speak from the Bible. That's what you do. You let the Bible speak. That's what you do. Don't devote your own self into bringing down a false prophet. You will fail, but God's word will not. With all of this, Paul emphasized the more, more, even more about their characteristics. He gives a true testimony against the false rebellious leader in verses 12 through 14. Paul uses an unbiblical uh, source to explain a truth by their own prophet speaking the truth against him. Them, I'm sorry. This does not now validate using unbiblical sources. It emphasizes the point. See, a Cretan seer named Epimenides, I can't say his name, he was uh, one who was accredited with having advised the Athenians uh, to set up altars to the unknown gods. This, this prophet or, or lying prophet was a liar honored as a god by his own countrymen. And what Paul was doing is Paul is exhibiting how their own liars spoke against them using three detrimental points. He called their himself, they were unfaithful liars, they are unfaithful beasts, and they are unfaithful lazy gluttons. The term, the verbal term um, for liar was known as cretinize um, and it meant to lie back in those ancient times. To cretinize meant to lie like a cretin, just like, you know, Corinthian eyes. Very interesting. 
He also called them false, I mean, evil beasts. They, basically, that's self-explanatory. They were evil monsters. They were horrible. They were also unfaithful, lazy gluttons. The King James Version calls them slow bellies. Paul, Paul had a parallel description in the epistle to the Philippi describing those who were enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, their belly or stomach, and whose glory is in their shame, who set up in their minds on earthly who set their minds on earthly things. That's in Philippians three nineteen and twenty. Number two as to why there is a reason that strong male leaders are needed. Number two, a defiled, rebellious leader claims to know God. See, this sounds like a crazy thing after getting a description of what false teachers look like. But we must remember Satan's men have to look like they are godly. It says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 through 15, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Matthew 7.15 warns us and says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. See, Paul basically gives Titus uh, an understanding of their mind. In other words, their outward behavior was a great indication of what was going on on the inside of them. He defined First, the mind of a faithful man, and that pure faith produces a pure mind. And then he defines the mind of a, of a rebellious leader. And that kind of mind has a defiled faith that equals a defiled profession filled with hypocrisy. In other words, their deeds prove whether they are true or not. Deeds always prove prove whether someone is really in the Lord or really knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm going to just leave with this scripture here. And that is in James 2 verse 17 through 26. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will sh show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was his faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she said she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way, whereas the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Recognize the behavior and you will easily recognize who the rebellious man is. Men, are you ready to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ? We need strong male leaders. God bless my beloved. Stand to the Word of God. Uh, I mean, I never thought about doctrine. You know, doctrine is what screwed the church up all this time anyway.